Good evening, and thanks for joining us. I'm Charlie Hoslett, and I'm the Vice Chancellor for University Relations here at UW-Madison. It's my pleasure to facilitate today's discussion, which is intended for our broad campus community, including our students, our parents, faculty, staff, and other groups. Please note that our McBurney Disability Resource Center is providing captioning and interpretation services via the links listed below the video. And a recording will also be, be available on YouTube for further viewing later on. First, on behalf of Chancellor Blank and the whole UW-Madison leadership team, I wanna say how much we appreciate you being here today and for the role that you're all playing in keeping our campus and our community healthy and safe. Thanks everyone for pulling together in the face of such unprecedented adversity that we as a nation, as a world have struggled through for the last 12 months. As you know, we've implemented a new testing and tracking system for spring semester that will allow the university to fulfill its essential mission while still protecting students and employees alike. This is a bold solution to a big problem shaped by advice from scientific experts, public health agencies, and many of you. The new Safer Badgers program will dramatically expand our testing cap capabilities with the goal of quickly identifying people who may be asymptomatic carriers before they unknowingly spread the virus to others. Our five panelists represent a much larger team of people who have been helping develop the university's COVID response plan. And so let me introduce them briefly. Joining us today is Lori Reeser, oh, excuse me, uh, Carol, Carol Griggs, Director of Operations with University Health Services, who leads the daily operations and planning of testing, in addition to the work being done at, on vaccine distribution. Argyle Wade, who is Chief of Staff for the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, who has been leading the planning around many of the logistics related to the new approach for spring. Todd Schechter, who's our Chief Technology Officer. Todd has been leading the creation of the Safer Badgers app. Mark Walters, our Chief Human Resources Officer, who is on hand to address employee related questions. And, and last but certainly not least, Lori Reeser, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, whose office is working with individual students and student groups on a variety of issues related to Safer Badgers and the pandemic overall. Let's start with Lori, if I could. Lori, we're hearing from a lot of students and others who are interested in understanding better why we're taking the approach that we have this semester. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Charlie. And thanks to everyone who's joining in tonight for this broadcast. The new testing requirements and campus access changes are a huge shift. And you may be wondering, why, why have we gone in this direction? Why would we have made these changes? We've done a lot of listening to many voices, many perspectives about the university's COVID response the past several months, including, of course, national or our, our local and national health experts and many of you. And all of that feedback has really influenced the changes that we've made. We learned from the experience this fall that intensive testing followed by quick isolation and quarantine is really key. In this new program, we'll dramatically expand the scope and frequency of our testing efforts. The idea is to quickly identify students or individuals who might be asymptomatic carriers before they unknowingly spread this virus to their peers and their friends or colleagues. And we also know different now this semester than from the fall is that there's new variants and variants that are even spreading more quickly um, than what we had um, in the fall. And so again, staying on top of that and keeping everybody safe is just really, really crucial. So we know this is, takes more time, more planning, both uh, for on and off campus students, but we really believe that it's worth it, not just for UW, but for really the entire Dane County community. I know the semester is just getting underway, but what can you tell us about what we're hearing from students about their reaction to Safer Badger so far? Yeah, it's great to have students back on campus and it's so much fun to be on campus and to be able to see students walking around, trotting, you know, tromping through all the snow and slush that we now have right now. Um, but we do know and believe that our students want to do the right thing. They care deeply about this pandemic and keeping our community and our campus safe. And so overall, 
they agree with it philosophically, they know it's the right thing to do, they know it's the right approach. However, we also know there's been some glitches, there's been some challenges, and it's a whole new process. And so I think there are some frustrations and some stresses and challenges that some of our students have experienced. And we just are really asking for their patience and, um, and really grace. And just to know that the staff involved in this program are working literally almost 24 seven to, to get things resolved to listen to the feedback. We continue to get input. And I know from my first test that I did to the third test that I've done, um, things have changed. And I could already tell that process improvements have made have been made. So we really do take um, the feedback very seriously. We do have a, a actual COVID advisory board of undergraduate students. There's a similar board for graduate students as well, who are also providing feedback and in, input to us on a regular basis. So we're taking all of that feedback very, very seriously and doing the best that we can right now. Great, thanks, Lori. And we'll come back to you again uh, with some more questions in a bit. But uh, let's move now to Carol Griggs uh, and talk a, bit, a little bit about the health perspective. Carol, uh, if you would talk about why we chose the Safer Badgers program and how the implementation has been going so far. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Charlie. So the Safer Badger program is a combination of two elements. There is the actual testing program, which I'll talk about in a second, but there's also the Safer Badger application, which um, is the technological component that kind of governs how we uh, function within the Safer Badger platform. And so um, from a testing standpoint, um, there are a couple things that we need to kind of go through, and then we can talk about some of the specifics at the site. Um, and so the first thing that students uh, that we kind of communicated out to students was that they need to get their app, um, that, that they need to get tested, that they need to get their results, and then finally they will get access. And so again, get that, get the app, get tested, get the results, um, and get access. And that's not just for our students, that's for everyone that's on our campus. Um, the Safer Badger application allows us to have a more streamlined approach to how we manage a lot of these things. And so that's really something that we've pushed um, to everyone that's on our campus. And so the populations that are required to test um, this semester include our undergraduate population, that's those that are on campus, as well as those that live in the city of Madison that are coming to campus. Um, those that li live in Madison that aren't coming to campus are also uh, required to test. And then our graduate and employee populations are required to test at least once a week. The undergraduate population is required to test twice a week, um, and that'll kind of help us to really measure the um, positivity and the incidence and prevalence of COVID among that population. And so once students um, and employees and, and staff um, go for their COVID test, there are a couple things that they really need to know. Um, we transitioned to the saliva-based strategy specifically so that we can ensure that we had enough tests for everyone um, that wanted a test and that needed a test. Um, using the nasal swab uh, system, we didn't have the same level of throughput that we have with the saliva strategy. Um, but using a saliva strategy is really important that people know how to deliver a good sample. Um, and that's a new uh, that's a new thing to learn. Not everyone's it's not intuitive to drool into a funnel. And so um, we've done a lot of education on just kind of really walking people through the best way to do that. Um, and so when when a person gets to the site, we actually have staff that are on site to help folks um, with their drool sample. I mean, we have videos out there now um, and we've been talking people through the best way to do it. And, and ultimately it boils down to um, really focusing on uh, creating saliva in the bottom of your mouth and pulling it under your tongue to actually project it into your, uh, into your funnel, um, which then gets into the vial. That's the goal. We don't want folks pulling um, saliva or spit from the back of their mouth. It will pull particles uh, and other food um, elements forward. And we don't want that. That actually results in a rejected sample or in a, in a sample that isn't quality enough to actually result. Um, and so there's a lot of education out there on that. But we've also worked really specifically with our population so that um, folks know how to do that. Another thing that um, we really want people to, to keep in mind when they get to the sites we have a lot of safety protocols that are in place. Um, there are dots that uh, all participants are required to stand on when they get to the site. And that's both when they get inside the facility where they're leaving their sample, as well as if they get there and there's a short wait. Um, we have dots that you know everyone is standing on. And while you stand on those dots, um, we strongly encourage everyone to keep their mask up until they're actually uh, ready to, to deliver that uh, saliva sample. Um, we've really encouraged people to pull their drool before they get to the site to enhance how much they can, how quickly they can deliver that sample when they get there. 
Um, it reduces the amount of time at the site, which is also another goal um, that we have in this strategy. We want people to get tested, but we really want to get them in and out of the sites as quickly as possible. Um, and so that's somewhat of a big picture overview of this strategy. Um, and we're, we're really, we're, we're not only excited about the strategy itself, but we're really hopeful that it does help us to really measure um, positivity and in the incidence and prevalence of COVID so that we can reduce it on our campus. Very good. Thanks for all that, Carol. You know, we're getting lots of questions, as you know, about Safer Badgers, but I think the number one question we're getting right now is people wondering uh, when they can expect to get their test results. Can you talk a little bit about what our goal is in terms of turnaround time on those tests and, and how we've been doing? Yeah, sure. So um, our goal is 24 hours. We really want everyone to have their results within 24 hours. Um, as Lori mentioned earlier, this is a new process. And so we are asking for folks to be patient and have a lot of grace. Um, we're working with a new lab. And um, as they work to improve their processes and we work to improve ours, we have seen um, situations where the results do take longer than that. That is not the goal. The goal is to bring it below 24 hours. Um, one of the things that we've uh, been communicating a lot in the last week, at least, is that if an individual has gone for a COVID test and they haven't gotten their results within 48 hours, which we have seen that some, we encourage them to just go and get another test. Because again, there's a window of time that we're able to really measure um, positivity and get them out of the population. And we don't want um, folks waiting that long for a result. And so the goal is 24 hours. But if you don't have your result while we work through some of these um, processes, definitely go back and get another test um, if you haven't gotten it within 48 hours. Good. And um, we're also getting questions uh, from people who've had their, their sample rejected. And mm -hmm. you touched on a little bit about the proper way to do this. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about uh, what we're doing to help people understand the best way to, 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 uh, to, to provide a, a usable sample? Sure. Um, so we do have education out there on what a usable sample is. Um, most of the rejections that we see, um, which it makes sense because we're we're in uh, flu season and we're in winter, um, is that folks are actually um, depositing mucus samples from the back of their mouth into their sample. And that's actually um, it's an easy thing to do because we don't always we're not we're not used to pulling saliva from the front of our mouth under the, under, under the tongue. Um, we are accustomed to pulling it from the back. And so mucus is one of the biggest issues that we see. Um, but we've also seen discoloration in samples, other food particles that are in sample, um, as well as people leaving too much of a sample. Um, we only need one milliliter to one point five milliliters of saliva. We don't need more. In this case, more is not better, um, but we, don't, we also don't need less. And so um, we do have education out there, but again, on site, uh, when individuals report to the site to leave their sample, we have staff there to help them. Um, and then even after they, they deposit the sample into the vial, staff assess the sample on site to let them know if um, they feel that they need to deposit another sample. And so it's really important that folks listen to the staff um, that are there and kind of offering them guidance. Very good. Thank you again. We'll be back to you with more questions in a bit. Um, I'm going to move back to move now, excuse me, to Argyle Wade. Um, uh, Argyle, uh, talk a little bit about the building access portion of the plan, if you would. Um, you know, as you know, we're going to have restrictions. Um, people will, will need uh, to show a certain uh, badge to be able to get into the buildings. Talk about when that all begins and what's just going to look different day to day. Sure, thanks, Charlie. Part of our new initiative includes monitoring access to high activity buildings. We really wanna make sure that only those people who've kept up with their testing are allowed to enter. And that means everyone, including faculty, staff, and students are gonna to have to show their Badger badge to gain entry. You can get your Badger badge within the Safer Badger app by scrolling down to the Your Health section. Your building access is granted or denied based on your testing status. Simply, we don't want anyone who's COVID positive or has a close contact with a COVID positive person to be among others. Now, let me be clear though, this requirement for building entry doesn't start until Monday, February 8th. No one, a student or employee should be restricted from any campus space until then. And while people don't have to show your badge until that date, we do wanna encourage people to start getting in the habit of doing it. So you might be asking yourself though, you know, who's doing this monitoring around campus? Well. We've hired Badger Wellness Ambassadors, who's gonna be at the entrances of select facilities around campus, and you simply need to show them your Badger badge to gain entry to that building. It has a color of the day, a moving circle, your picture, and your status to enter the building, but importantly, it does not show your personal health information. 
These Badger Wellness Ambassadors are going to be moving around campus. That means you might see them a building one day, but not the next. And if you can't get into a building, but you're not sure why, we do have a COVID helpline. It's 608-262-7777. They can help you figure out what needs to be done. And even though we won't be starting restricting access until Monday, February 8th, there are already Badger Wellness Ambassadors out on our campus, and they're going to help you get used to this new process. Very good. Argyle, um, we've got a number of people asking, you know, what do they need if they're only coming to campus, say, once a week or uh, once every couple of weeks, or maybe they're not planning to come to campus at all this semester. They still need the badge? Yeah, if you're an employee who never comes to campus or a student who doesn't come, uh, then, you know, the employees, they don't need to worry about the badge or badge because you're not testing a university site. Um, obviously, uh, if you do come to campus uh, and you have a negative test result within the past eight days for being an employee, uh, then you do you need to follow that process. Students, similarly, uh, as Carol said earlier, depending upon the student where you live and your testing cycle, you may need to be testing. Uh, but if you're if you're in a situation where you're you know not in that test regimen, uh, you don't need to worry about that. Um, basically, what we're saying is, if you're on campus, uh, then you need to to be testing. Uh, and you should be giving yourself enough time to do that. You want to come at least uh, one day in advance of when your compliance uh, to come to campus. Make sure you give yourself plenty of time. But I do want to emphasize that you know a person coming to campus, if they have an emergency, the only really emergencies we're allowing somebody to come into a building for is somebody who's related to life or property safety. And this really, for us, this means first responders, uh, people who have facility emergencies, all other cases really don't rise to the level of an emergency that would necessitate living somebody into a building that isn't tested. And the bottom line is we just don't want people to be put at risk to be around and, uh, around others. Of course, we have these Badger Wellness Ambassadors. They have supervisors who can help you work through access problems if you run into a situation like that. Got it. Thank you. Um, let's move to uh, Todd Schechter. Uh, Todd, you've been, <clears throat> you've been involved in developing a whole new app to support the Safer Badgers program. I know this has been a, a challenging process and one that you and literally, uh, you and, and others have spent literally hundreds of hours on. Can you give us an update on where things are at with the Safer Badgers app? Absolutely, Charlie, thanks for the question. And, and yes, this, is, this has been a huge effort. Um, the Safer Badgers app has involved many, many people across campus. And if you happen to be one of those folks that are watching tonight, uh, my thanks and appreciation for uh, everyone who's been a part of this effort. Uh, the Safer Badgers app is available today for both the Apple iPhone as well as the uh, Google Android platform. You can download the apps from saferbadgers.wisp.edu. Uh, the apps show up in your in your normal app store uh, like, like you would expect. Um, as of yesterday, we've had 51,000 downloads of the Safer Badgers app, which is great. It's great to see people adopting the app and, and getting to know how to, to use the app. Um, we continue to make improvements on the app. Uh, one of the biggest changes that we made as of last weekend was um, moving away from appointment-based uh, scheduling. Uh, we saw a number of challenges with have folks having appointments, missing their appointments, standing in line too long. And so uh, as of last Sunday, we've moved to just all drop-by testing. And if you're in the Safer Badgers app and if you tap on the button that says find test locations, you'll be able to see real-time updates on what the line conditions are like at uh, each of our 14 sites uh, across campus. Um, this is a big deal for us. This is a big deal to have the trust in this app. Um, we've used industry best practices. Our app has been certified by Apple, by Google. It's been reviewed by a number of different groups. Um, it's compliant for all of the healthcare information that we need, um, that, that we need and, and that we have trust in. So. Um, again, if you haven't picked up the app yet, we'd encourage you to head to saferbadgers.wisp.edu um, and just know that, that um, there are multiple things that you can do within the app. Um, exposure notification is a big part of it, though. This is a Bluetooth exposure notification, which is an opt-in feature that allows you to know if you've come within uh, 6 to 10 feet for a period of two hours or longer of someone who may uh, test positive for COVID. Um, this is a separate feature than what the state of Wisconsin offers through the Wisconsin Exposure Program. Uh, we certainly encourage folks to sign in to, uh, to both features, though. Um, so again, saferbadgers.wisp.edu if you haven't had a chance to pick up our Safer Badgers app yet. Thanks, Charlie. Great. Thanks, Todd. Say so one question that I know we've gotten is about how people can add other test results that they've received 
um, to the app. You know, they may have gotten a, a test at the Aligned Energy Center here in Madison or maybe from another third party like their healthcare provider. Is there a way for them to add their um, a, a negative test that they've gotten elsewhere to the app? There is, Charlie. So once you're signed into the Safer Badgers app with your uh, UW Madison net ID, username and password, uh, if you scroll down in there, there's a section for adding off campus positive test results. Um, we are only able to accept positive test results uploaded through the app, and they must be PCR tests. So they must be PCR uh, positive tests. And if you upload those through the app, one of our medical providers from University Health Services will evaluate that test and then set your badge uh, accordingly. We've had, uh, geez, close to a thousand people so far that have used this and uh, we're all caught up with our backlog right now. So again, if you have a positive off-campus test, uh, you can absolutely upload that through the app. Very good. Um, one other question for you before uh, we move on. Uh, what about people who may not have access to a smartphone um, or perhaps they don't want to use their personal smartphone. Uh, do they have access to a, a, another device so they can download the Safer Badgers app? Yeah, absolutely, Charlie. And, and we recognize um, uh, we recognize that some folks don't have a smartphone or wish not to use their personal smartphone for the Safer Badgers app. Um, if, if that's you, then I would certainly just encourage you to head to saferbadgers.wist.edu through the Division of Information and Technology Help Desk we have a loaner program available for locked down smartphones. So these are smartphones that are available free of charge. They come with an AT&T data plan, uh, but they're only they're only for use with the Safer Badgers app. Uh, we're checking these out uh, same day, uh, and and so by all means, if you if you don't have a smartphone or you choose not to use your own smartphone, we're we're absolutely here to help and support you. Great, thanks so much. We're going to turn now to Mark Walters, our Chief Human Resources Officer. Um, Mark, uh, can you talk a little bit about what our employees need to know about complying with the new protocol? Well, employees really need to keep themselves informed of all the things that are going on, the public health protocols that are out there for the, the, the spring semester. And, and we do have a, a wealth of information through uh, frequently asked questions. We have over 100 of those uh, FAQs on our websites and in various areas. So really keeping keeping up to speed and all the things that uh, that we need to do as uh, part of the, the Badger community, the folks that are coming to campus. And, and that includes all the testing uh, activities. You heard that uh, today from uh, some of our panelists, uh, the things that need, need to be done. Uh, I've gone through a, a, a few cycles myself in the, in the testing area. I would completely agree with Lori that as I've, as I've gone in with uh, first with the, the scheduled uh, uh, test uh, and then now with the walk-in testing that that things continue to evolve and, and become uh, more efi uh, um, efficient and effective. And so uh, we've already talked about those employees that uh, that would periodically come to campus. They're going to need to plan to, to uh, get tested before they do come to campus so that they can access the, the access their, their building sites, their work sites. Also, uh, we're, we're going to support employees uh, wherever we can to, to help follow those protocols and uh, um, and be right now. It's we've gone through the soft launch that uh, that we've talked about. But uh, uh, come February eighth, uh, uh, there, there will be the full compliance. And and you know we're, again, we're going to support employees as much as we can. Uh, but when, if an employee decides that they 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 really uh, um, don't um, want to be compliant in this area, we, we will address that. We will be holding people accountable to make sure that we keep the campus safe, including the possibility of of discipline if if, if that's if that's happening if that's not happening. And you know that's obviously uh, going to be hopefully a rare thing. Uh, but I did want to uh, mention that. Very good, um, Mark. For you, um, is there a process for employees to request a medical accommodation regarding these testing requirements and? What about non-medical accommodations or exemptions that people might ask for? Yeah, the, yes, there is a process. If if you uh, if you are requesting a medical accommodation, employees would work with our division disability representative that we have in each of our college schools and divisions, and working with that DDR to to um, um, talk about the 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 needs and to really figure out uh, where we would go and 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 whether that uh, uh, can be accommodated. For the non-medical accommodation type issues, 
the the employee would work with their human resource representative uh, within their organization uh, to try to address those concerns. Super. And again, uh, a lot of these questions are um, uh, can be answered on the uh, FAQ that we've got that we encourage people to look at. It's uh, covidresponse.wisc.edu and just look for the FAQ uh, tab. One other question for you, Mark, given that we're expecting employees to follow this testing protocol as a condition of their employment, can they get tested during work hours? How does all that work? Yes, uh, we've set the program up so that employees will be able to uh, get tested during their work hours uh, so that uh, allowing a, a, an amount of time for employees to go to the testing centers and, and, and get tested. Uh, we realize that there are, there, there are times and issues where uh, employees uh, um, may need to get tested um, uh, outside of those work hours. And, and we are, we are um, providing support in that area. Uh, issues when employees go on vacation and they might take a week vacation, they'll be out of the eight-day compliance window and they won't be able to test during normal work hours. Uh, providing them with flexibility and, in some cases, uh, providing them some, um, some time, some paid leave, or I should say some paid uh, um, uh, options to come in and get tested uh, outside of their, their uh, normal work. Uh, that would be rare, but we, are, um, um, we will be having that type of option for employees working with the, the employees, working with their human resource representative and their supervisor in those circumstances. Great, thanks. I wanna go back to Lori, uh, if I can, Vice Chancellor Reeser. Lori, along with the, the physical risk associated with the pandemic and the virus, we've also seen a lot of people experiencing anxiety and stress, which of course is perfectly understandable. And I can imagine that for some folks, the new testing protocols that we've implemented could be adding to that stress. I'm wondering if you could remind us again about who needs to get tested when and what we're doing to help people uh, alleviate some of that stress that they might be feeling. Yeah, absolutely, Charlie. I, I mean, I, I think this is obvious. This is a really difficult time for everybody right now. It's a difficult time in our world. It's a difficult time in our country. I mean, we're dealing with a pandemic. And I think we always have to remind ourselves that we're dealing with a pandemic, which just adds an, a very a large amount of stress. We're also dealing with issues of increased social injustice that are happening around in our country, financial and economic pressures that our students and our families are, are feeling. So the stress is super high for everybody. And then on top of that, we've now added more testing requirements for our students. And I do want to clarify um, a piece that was said earlier. So the students that have to, re so our res hall students are, they're in the routine, they're continuing their patterns, they're doing exactly what they've always done, testing twice a week and, and that same process. It's our off-campus students that we're asking to do something new and different. And that's hard. And I know that's really, really stressful. And, and I'm so impressed by how many of our students we're, we're really being incredibly safe. We're limiting their contact and limiting their pods. But the students who are within a certain number of zip codes, and those are all on the website, regardless of whether they're coming to campus or not, or they're right there in the picture, um, they do have to test twice a week. So for our students, it's not just whether you're coming to campus or not. We're asking all of our off-campus students to test twice a week. The reason for that, again, is we're trying to curb the spread of this awful virus. And even though, thankfully, most of our students aren't always affected or impacted if they get the virus, we don't know who else they're coming into contact with. If they're at the grocery store, if they're running errands, if they're going to get a coffee, they could be in contact with people um, from the general public. So we're not only trying to keep our students safe, our campus community safe, we're really trying to do what's right for the broader community of Dane County. So. That's new and that's stressful. And honestly, I think some students are frustrated, even though cognitively they believe and know it's the right thing to do. We've kind of upset their apple cart by adding this new routine. I know for myself, the first time I went and got tested, it did feel stressful because I was around strangers. I haven't really been around strangers very much at all. So that felt hard. Pulling my mask down and drooling was like, it, it, even though I was six feet apart or more so from people and I knew it was safe, it felt scary and it felt it was raising my anxiety. And so we just have to acknowledge that it's hard. It's a different routine. But remember for those of us way back in the summer or the spring when we got our first nasal test, I was like ripping to my car so hard, like you are not gonna stick this thing up in my nose. Now I take a nasal test any day, right? 
So we just have to get used to this new routine, get used to this new process. We know it's hard. We know it's difficult. It's taking deep breaths. It's kind of, you know, repeating those messages over and over in your head. This is safe. People have, you know, made all of these options or all of these requirements safe because we're obviously not trying to spread um, this virus in any other form. So I think just acknowledging that and, and eventually, and now I have my routine, I know how to do it and, 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 and it's fine, it's fine. So I know we'll get there. Our students are incredibly resilient. Our community is incredibly resilient. Of course, we have services and mental health services if students are really stressed and need it. But I think it's just kind of getting used to this whole new system. And I think the last thing I would just really ask for everybody is to be kind to the people that are working. You know, some of them are students, some of them are learning this. I mean, I know I had a person who kind of got stuck and was struggling a little bit. They're doing the best they can and we'll get there. And if we could just take a breath, just, you know, do whatever you need to do. There's a great Center for Healthy Minds app that's out there for people um, to, to take care of themselves, but really to treat people with respect and dignity and patience. I think that's the most important thing. We all deserve that now more than ever and just ask for that again as we go through this new process. That, that's uh, excellent advice. Um, thanks, Lori. We're about halfway through our, our session today. I wanna to, um, thank those of you who have been able to join us for the whole time. I wanna welcome those of you who may have joined us a little bit late. Um, we've got a, a, a panel of, uh, of university experts here that are talking through the COVID response, the new policies and protocols that are in place. I wanna go back to a question that we started with at the top, but we uh, get, get this question a lot, and this is back to Carol. Um, what are people are wondering about how quickly they're going to get their test results? What's our goal for that turnaround time and, and what are we seeing? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so the goal again is 24 hours. We really, our goal is to turn around those, those results within 24 hours. Um, as Lori mentioned, as we stand up a new program, we're, you know, it's, they're going to be bumps in the road. Um, and we have seen some of those. And so what we've told folks this week is that if they take a test and they don't have their results within 24 hours, and really if they um, give it until about 48 hours, if they still don't have their result, they really should go and have another test. Um, we're, that's constantly something that we're working on and we're watching. Um, but if they don't have a result within 48 hours, we do strongly encourage that they go ahead and get another test. Excellent, thanks. So we've posted a wealth of information uh, again on our COVID response website. That's covidresponse.wisc.edu, uh, including more than a hundred frequently asked questions. Um, and I think we've got a graphic <clears throat> that shows what some of those most most frequently asked questions are. Um, if we can, I think we can put that up. Um, but I would like to tackle some of those so that people people hear about them uh, directly. Um, and I'm going to go back to you, Carol. One of the questions we get often is, uh, can people take a nasal swab test instead of the saliva-based test? Yeah, so the nasal swab testing currently is available for our students that live in the um, residence halls. We do have an accommodation process that is available. And so if folks have a medical condition that prevents their participation in the saliva-based strategy, they can contact, for students, they can contact McBurney. Um, for employees, they can contact their DDR. And once that request is approved, we will provide instructions on how they can acquire a nasal swab. Thanks. Another question that we're getting will stick with you. Uh, can someone test positive for COVID uh, if, uh, if they've been vaccinated? Great question. Um, so the answer is no. Um, the vaccine actually doesn't have any live viral cells in it. Um, and so it's not gonna cause COVID or it's not gonna make you test positive for COVID in any kind of way. Um, the, the, the vaccine is based on uh, um, M, N, M, mRNA, excuse me. Um, and that's actually something that helps the body to respond appropriately with uh, creating antibodies. And so no, they won't test positive if they have the vaccine. A uh, number of questions um, that we've gotten relate around re relate to people whose tests have come back as invalid or inconclusive or rejected. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I think this goes to the sample. Carol, what, what does that mean when that happens? Yeah, typically if the result comes back and is invalid, inconclusive, um, indeterminate, 
um, or if it's rejected altogether, that means that the sample was not adequate enough to be processed. Um, again, that can mean that it had mucus in it, there was discoloration, um, the volume might not have been where it needed to be, or there were food particles in it. Um, and when that happens, you actually can't get a good result. Um, and so at that point, the, the result that you would get in your app is, you know, rejected or inconclusive or indeterminate. Got it, got it. Um, and um, we're going to stick with you again, a lot of questions around uh, sort of a public health aspect of this. Um, uh, is there uh, in the testing area, testing sites, uh, if someone can't cover their face in public, is there a private place where they can pr uh, provide that saliva sample? Yeah, so in those cases, I would strongly recommend that someone contacts, if it's a student, they should contact McBurney. If it's an employee, they should contact their DDR. We do have um, one area at uh, two sites that are accommodation areas, and for instances like that, where uh, we can provide a level of privacy. Um, that's not something that we can open up for um, easy access or broad access. And the reason being is because this particular saliva-based strategy is an observed strategy. And so we have to have staff that can monitor the, the, the actual um, deposit of the sample. Um, and so we have to uh, coordinate that to ensure that we have someone behind the curtain with you still six feet apart, if not a further distance. Um, and so it has to be coordinated. But if someone has a medical condition, that requires that they, um, you know, have to have that privacy area. We can't accommodate that, but they need to go through the proper channels. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, let me go to uh, to Argyle with this one. Um, can a person apply for an accommodation to be excused from the testing requirement? Sure, uh, and we have different routes for that based on your role on campus. So, uh, if you are a student at McBurney Disability Resource Center. Uh, is where you would apply for that accommodation for a medical accommodation. There's a, on the COVID website, there's a form that you would fill out to start that process. Uh, if you're an employee, then you would go through uh, your human resources uh, divisional disability representative to be able to start that process as an employee. Um, if you're uh, looking at a situation where you have a non-medical situation for a student that would go to our Dean of Students office, and for an employee that would go to our human resources uh, divisional representative for human resources. So it just depends upon your role on campus and what the reason is that you're needing to seek an accommodation or exception for. But all of that is listed on the website for the COVID response. Got it. And um, uh, Carol, back to you with one last one. Uh, why is the university using a saliva-based test instead of the nasal swab test that as Lori said, uh, many people got used to during the first semester? Yeah, Charlie, that's a great question. Um, honestly, if we could have acquired um, a strategy with nasal swab that could accommodate 84,000 tests a week, we absolutely would have done it. I think that um, we, we would have loved to have stuck in with a strategy that um, everyone was already familiar with. Um, but to, to really gain the throughput and the volume that we needed, we had to find a strategy that would enable us to do that. And that was the saliva-based strategy. Um, this is the same uh, process that the University of Illinois uses. Um, and so we looked at a lot of different strategies that were out there, and this is the one that we were able to acquire um, to meet the needs of our population this semester. Great. So again, that's uh, 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 the answers to a lot of the FAQs that we're getting. Um, and uh, we, we encourage you to look at the website to look at those. We've gotten a number of additional questions that I want to go to. Um, and I want to go to, um, to uh, Argyle again with this one, or, or perhaps uh, Lori. What happens when, when people, students, uh, in particular, don't comply with the masking or the physical distancing requirements that we have. Or you want to start off and then I'll come back. Okay, I'll take that then. <laughs> um, so obviously our first approach is always trying to say, hey, you know, do reminders. I ask people, uh, oftentimes it's, this is not intentional. Uh, people make a mistake, they forget the mask, uh, they forget to be a little distanced. Uh, so we really just want you to use a lot of grace and uh, give people the ability to make that adjustment. Uh, obviously, if we get in a situation where uh, someone chooses not to, to follow our campus rules, we do have the ability uh, to you know, kind of give more institutional reminders and move into our conduct process for students. Uh, you know, obviously human resources always have the processes with employees. We, we find by and large, we don't need to go there. Um, but those are at our discretion if we need to, to take those up. Got it. Um, Mark, uh, let me go to you with this question. Uh, do employees who are working off campus, say at an agricultural research station, need to be tested? 
Uh, no, they do not need to be tested if they're not working on the main uh, Madison campus. But if they are, if they are coming to the Madison uh, campus, the main campus, uh, they do need to comply and, and make proper arrangements to get tested uh, before they can have access to to our facilities. Good, um, Todd. Another. Uh, oh, sorry. Someone could jump in there. Nope. Thought I heard some feedback. Todd, uh, another IT question. We we know we've had technical uh, assistance out at many of the testing sites over the past couple of weeks, helping folks with the Safer, Safer Badgers app. Are there any tips or tricks that uh, we might pass on to folks who, who want to make sure they're optimizing the, the app? Yeah, absolutely, Charlie. So it's, it's real simple. Uh, what we're asking folks to do is to make sure you have the Safer Badgers app before you come to the testing center, make sure you're signed into it, make sure you, you have uh, good Wi-Fi, um, that you've completed the personal information section, and that you have your QR code up and ready to go. Uh, so the QR code, you just go to the Badger Badge uh, section, swipe to the right, and you'll have your QR code up and ready to go. Um, and, and Charlie, just to say again, uh, you know, one of the places that I go if I have questions about Saber Badgers is right to our FAQ site. And so uh, if folks have any questions whatsoever before they come to their test, uh, we certainly encourage them to uh, to visit the FAQs here at uh, covidresponse.wist.edu. Very good. Uh, an important question that that uh, that we get uh, is uh, which is the most fun testing site? And uh, Lori, I, I don't know if you want to answer that one. I do I do? So my secret one, my favorite one, has been the Cole Center, um, partially because there's high ceilings, and so that makes me feel a little bit safer. Partially because I get to get in the Cole Center, which I've not been able to do, and so I feel a little bit closer to Wisconsin athletics, which we all so greatly miss um, being able to participate. So that would be my favorite one. But I've heard that Dejope has music or the students were dancing over in Dejope when they were turning theirs in, their samples in. So that sounds fun. I've heard another site, um, 21 North Park has music, calm music. So maybe, I don't know, Carol, is there some psychological thing? If you have the right music, it makes you drool better. I, I don't know, maybe, I think for me, I have to go back to like playing lullabies, like when my, with my babies or something, you know, when they were little, like what makes you drool? Like what kind of music makes you drool? Is it hip hop? Is it rap? Is it soft music? I don't know. That could be a whole new research study. I'm not going to look into, right? So yeah, I think, I think it's just preference. Yeah, no, I think the music really, it, it, it doesn't necessarily enhance the drool technique, but I think it does make you feel, you know, good enough to feel like you're actually able to like party or, or be calm as in 21 North Park. Um, they, they show up though, I, I have to say on Monday, they, they did have a little hip hop going. And so people were on the side dancing <laughs> as they were leaving their drool. Um, I've heard that Carson Gully is a great site and mechanical engineering. We do have some sites that are, are, are a little smaller. And so you have uh, when you when you go in there are only a couple of dots there, and so people enjoy that as well. Um, but we have, I mean, you can see all of our sites online, um, and they all seem really fun to me at some level. So maybe we should have a contest like the, like you know those like little passport things, right? Where you you know every time you test a different site, you get a little box or a little and a little prize for somebody who tests at every site or something. I don't know. We'll have to do something creative to ease the stress, make this more fun in these difficult times. I will say, you know, Larry, I think you're hearing something with Cole. There have been a lot of people going to Cole this last week. And honestly, that has unfortunately resulted in lines that have been forming at Cole. Um, in the app, if you log into the app, you can actually see the color of that app at that moment. And so if it's green, that means you have a really short wait. More than likely, you can walk in, get straight to a dot, leave your sample, and get out. People that went to green sites this week were able to be in and out in three to five minutes, uh, which is what we want. Um, sites that had a little bit longer wait, a um, little bit uh, above 15 minutes, but not 30 minutes, those were yellow. And then if there were, if there was more than a 30 minute wait, then the app would actually indicate that site is red. And so we are encouraging people to really pay attention to that before they go to their site, because we do want to utilize the sites that are green to really reduce any lines. Um, but coal does seem like a favorite for a lot of folks. Well, we've got a lot of conversation about the, uh, what's the best test site, but it, it raises a question, Carol, that we've gotten that I'm hoping you can answer. Um, last semester, as you know, we had drive-in test sites um, where people could drive up, stay in their car. We are not doing that this semester. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And so earlier I mentioned that we really had to go with a strategy that um, enabled us to have really high throughput. 
Um, and with the, the drop up sites, that's one of the issues that we do have for the semester is that the drop up sites actually have a really low throughput. And so at one saliva site, we can, you know, have 500 or 600 appointments a day, if not 800 or 1000 appointments a day. Um, at a drop up site, we can only have 84 appointments a day. And so that is one issue. Um, the other issue is that because it's winter and we are in Wisconsin, um, having staff stand, stand outside really isn't safe. Um, and so we did look at garages and different uh, facilities that we could use for drive up, but then we have to really be concerned about CO2 levels building up in those facilities. Um, and so for right now, we can't really do drive up. That is something that we have on the list to reconsider as we get closer to spring. Um, and so definitely stay tuned uh, as we get closer to spring. If that is an option that we can make available, we will definitely do that at that time. Okay. Um Carol, let me stick with you. Lori mentioned this uh, sort of uh, in her opening remarks, but there is a, uh, we're, we're seeing other variants of the mm -hmm. virus uh, uh, in, the, in the US. Um, what do we know about, about that? Um, are, are, is there any risk of people bringing a new strain uh, of COVID back to campus? Yeah, um, thanks for that question, Charlie. And so that's a that's a tough question because in the midst of a pandemic, um, you have to be vigilant with all strands that might um, appear and pop up. Um, and so we do know that this new variant is out there. We do know that it's circulating um, in different places around the world. There is no evidence that it is here. Um, however, we are being very vigilant and watching very closely. Uh, we're strongly encouraging folks to still abide by all the public health recommendations. And this testing strategy, what that does is it allows us to identify cases as quickly as possible so that we can get people out of the population isolated so that they can recover and then we can have folks quarantined that have been in close contact with them. And that is actually the one of the top strategies that are needed to reduce the prevalence and incidence of COVID. Um, if we can reduce transmission and reduce spreads, we can we can at some level protect our community from strands spreading um, that we're not as familiar with. And so it is something to be on the watch for. We, we just want people to ensure that they're following those public health protocols and work with us as we work to protect the campus. Very good. Um, I'm going to uh, toss this question. Maybe that's a combination of Argyle and Carol. Uh, but we had talked a little bit before about um, test results. Uh, while we have a goal of getting them back within 24 hours, sometimes we're seeing them being delayed. Uh, if someone uh, has taken a test, but their test result is delayed, but they need to get into a building, they need to go to class, they need to go to work, but they don't have the, uh, the, uh, the Safer Badgers green badge yet, how are, how are they supposed to handle that? Sure, thanks, Charlie. I, you know, as I spoke a little bit earlier, um, what we really deem is an emergency where somebody could get into a building without a, a green badge would be if there was a life safety issue, or a physical property emergency. And so that's where our, really our first responders, our emergency facility services uh, staff are the ones that would be in those situations. Uh, missing a, a test uh, in, in you know, kind of being late for class or uh, even teaching a class there isn't uh, deemed an emergency in those kind of at that level. We know that's important uh, and frustrating and, and will be a challenging situation, but we really ask in those situations that you not put other people at risk uh, that you contact your supervisor, uh, a colleague who could cover for you, uh, contact your professor uh, if it's your class. I mean, we're really hoping people take a flexible approach this year and understand situations are going to happen. Uh, but we really need to make sure we preserve uh, the insides of those buildings for people who have tested and who we can verify have the right badge status. So I, I take it that uh, uh, if someone is delayed in getting a test, one answer isn't um, that they can come up and uh, show up in full PPE and still be admitted? No, I don't think uh, that's going to work for us. There still is, you know, the ability for things to happen in our buildings and certainly the PPE helps. Uh, but I think that, you know, what really this testing strategy is really what we're looking for is our uh, means of intervention in terms of spreading the virus. Great, thanks. Um, Mark, I want to go back to you for a second, and you touched on this in your comments earlier, but um, I know we've gotten a question, and so for our employees out there that might be wondering it, or those who joined late, I wanted to, to, uh, to have you repeat it. You know, um, if uh, we, we talked about employees are able to be in pay status when they get tested, but uh, if an employee takes vacation, say, for more than a week, um, and they'll be out of the office for a period of more than eight days, 
but they'll need to get tested prior to returning to on-site work, say on Monday. So they've got to go in on a, a Saturday or a Sunday to get tested. Um, how does that how does that work? Are they covered? Yeah, the, the, and we're talking about employee, employees in hourly type positions that they they will be able to do that, get tested, and 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 be in paid status for two hours uh, to to uh, provide that uh, um, you know to provide for that time to come in and get tested. Uh, we, we realize that this, this is a this is an inconvenience coming back from vacation uh, that you have to come to campus and get tested, and so we want to we want to provide some. Uh, um, some time that people can be in paid status to 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 be compliant with the uh, with the requirements. Great. Thanks very much for that, um, <clears throat> Carol. We've talked a lot about testing. Let's talk just a little bit about vaccines. Um, happily, there are vaccines rolling out. Um, we're actually vaccinating people here on campus. Those that are that are eligible. Talk a little bit about where we're at in terms of who's being vaccinated. Uh, and at what point um, others can can expect to to be uh, alerted that they'll be uh, able to be vaccinated? Yeah, Charlie, absolutely. And so right now, nationally, we are in Tier 1A. Um, and so Tier 1A primarily is made up of uh, individuals that are healthcare professionals or those that have worked directly with COVID patients or COVID specimen. Um, and so we've been working hard for the last few weeks to vaccinate those that are in Tier 1A that we identified on our campus. Um, tier 1B um, is not quite here yet. The state has a definition um, that is somewhat solidified that they're, they've rolled, rolled out for Tier 1B, um, but they've marked Tier 1B as potentially starting on March March the 1st, on March 1. Um, and so we're not quite there as far as starting Tier 1B. We do project that we will be in Tier 1B um, uh, when we get to March the 1st. Within that, uh, portion of the recommendations. There's more information that's going to come out about it, but it does include um, different populations that we will likely have to communicate with on campus. Um, looking a little bit further out, Tier 1C um, is likely going to start later in the spring semester, and we don't have a clear definition on Tier 1C just yet. That's still information that we're waiting on direction from the state on. Um, and so we are working diligently to ensure not only that we're providing vaccines for those that are eligible, that we, but that we pay very close attention to what the state's guidance is on each one of the tiers or phases. Got it, got it. And of course, um, again, vaccines are, are important and we're all looking forward to that, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be following the public health guidelines that are out there right now. Continuing to, to wear face coverings, to continuing to physically distance, continuing to wash your hands, all the things that we've heard over and over for the last several months really do make a difference. Isn't that right, Carol? That is correct. The vaccine, even though we are dealing with a highly effective vaccine that has between a 95 and 97 percent efficacy, there's still a small margin of folks that will be vaccinated that could still transmit um, or catch COVID. And so we want to be very cautious and careful with that. Um, the CDC and DHS right now, they still recommend that all of the pu pu public health protocols are followed and abided by because we want to ensure that even for folks that are getting the vaccine, that they are still being as protective as possible of themselves and others around them. And so we, we definitely have to still follow those protocols. Got it. So we've got about five minutes left, and I just want to give everyone one last chance to go around and, and provide uh, any last thoughts or final reminders. And um, uh, Mark Walters, let's start with you. Well, I just wanted to say that uh, that we realize that all these things that we're putting in place add extra uh, um, extra responsibility that all employees need to follow. Uh, but we're do we're doing this to keep the the campus community uh, protected and safe and. And we, we all appreciate the things that folks are doing and, and we've all been through the, a lot over the last 10 months. And, and so I just wanna thank everyone for um, all, the, all the things that are being done and, and um, all the great work. Very good. Argyle, let's go to you next, please. So I would say my advice would be to plan ahead uh, with your work schedule, plan ahead with your school schedule. Then we are asking uh, for a new rhythm, a new pattern this semester. Uh, and, you know, that's going to take a little bit of forethought. And we really appreciate everybody who's already stepped up and done that. We know that it's a big adjustment. Uh, and we encourage you to keep thinking about how to do that and let us know what we can do to try to make it as easy on you as we can. Very good. Todd Schechter, our CTO, what do you have to say with, for folks as we leave? 
Yeah, Charlie, boy, I would just um, I would just reemphasize that uh, as you think about your trip to campus, please make sure you have the Safer Badgers app. And, and we're here for you. If you don't have a smartphone or wish not to use your personal smartphone, please reach out to us through the Do It Help Desk and we'll get you a smartphone free of charge that will allow you to use the Safer Badgers app. But please remember, technology alone is not gonna help us end COVID. Maintaining physical distancing, wearing a face covering, and, and, and keeping up with all of our personal hygiene. That's what's really important for us. So thanks, Charlie. Very good. Uh, Carol, what, what would you like to leave everyone with? Yeah, I mean, I honestly, I really, I'm so appreciative to um, all of the students and the staff and the faculty that have already engaged in testing. Um, their participation has allowed us to really perfect and tweak um, the process that we have. And I would really just encourage folks, as you come to the test sites, I really want you to know that, that there has been a team of public health professionals, epidemiologists, um, folks that work in environmental health and safety that have done so much work to, to ensure that this experience is a safe experience. I know that our experience in the fall with using nasal swabs um, uh, somewhat conditioned us in a way where we, uh, we grew very comfortable with the idea of social distance. We know that that's what we need to do. We know that we need to keep our mask on. Um, and this new strategy is one where we're transitioning into a, you know, an environment where there are gonna be other people appropriately social distance out, but it still can feel uncomfortable at time. And so I would just encourage folks, as you come to the test sites, know that, that UW-Madison has done so much work to ensure that these are safe environments and we continue to perfect them, we continue to improve them. And so definitely, um, you know, when you come to the test sites, have grace, uh, work with the staff that's there. If you have recommendations, we do want to hear those. Um, but just know that everything that we're doing really is for the protection of those that are coming to the sites. Very good. And Lori Reeser, I want to give you the last word. Awesome. Thank you. Of course, I have to talk about students and what their experience has been. And again, I just want to acknowledge this is hard. This is super hard. As a parent of a college student, not the way I wanted their freshman year to start. And so I get how difficult it is on our students and I get how difficult it is for our parents who are trying to support our students during this time. And so just know that we're doing everything we can um, to make the most of this experience. And part of the rationale for this testing is that if we know students um, want to use our facilities or services, that the people that are in those buildings that have tested negative that allows us to hopefully do more programming, more support, more activities in a safe way. Now we still have to follow all the public health guidelines and we will do that, but, but we're hoping that that will give us a little bit more flexibility um, to, do more, to do more for our students because we know our students are craving that engagement. They're craving connecting with faculty and staff and each other. The other two things I would say is one or two is um, embrace winter. And so being outside and um, even though it's a little chilly and a little snowy, we are doing winter festivals and trying to encourage students to, to do activities outside, to participate in some of these events. So that would be another piece of it. And then lastly, again, just because uh, the first year students, the freshmen, I think have had the most challenging. I always think about our freshmen and our seniors, right? Our seniors are still like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is the end and what's gonna happen and what's gonna happen with graduation. and we don't know, and we're still working and thinking about all those issues, but our first year students, this isn't the way they wanted to start. So we have a group that's gonna work on being intentional for those students when they become sophomores, of what did you miss your first year? And how do we compensate that? How do we make up for that? How do we do some special programming and outreach and support to catch you up? So know that we're aware that it's not the same, but again, I just have to tell you, our students are amazing and they're resilient and they get it and they understand and they wanna do what's right for each other and for the greater community. So we're just so thankful again, that we have amazing faculty and staff at UW-Madison who are putting this program together and for our students who are supporting us all along the way. So, and their parents. So thanks to the parents, of course, as well. Absolutely. And I wanna say thank you to our panelists for sharing their time and expertise tonight. We're, we're out of time, uh, but thank you more importantly to all of our viewers for tuning in to learn more. Please keep checking the COVID-19 response website for the latest information and our FAQs. Look in your email inbox for updates that are coming through. And remember, we've already done many, many more tests uh, this semester than we've done last semester. We are well on our way. 
uh, and thanks in large part and thanks to the campus community coming together. And we will continue to improve based on the feedback that, we get, that we're getting from you. So thank you again, be well, stay safe, and on Wisconsin.